So in this video, I want to go ahead and take a look at CPM3 on the Micromate PMC-101 uh, computer that we've been looking at in the previous videos. Uh, what we have here is a PDF of the user's manual, and over here I have TerraTerm set up to talk to it at 9600 baud. Uh, we can look at this serial port set up here. It's 9600 baud, 8N1, pretty typical. Uh, Let's look at some of the notes in the manual here first. There's some interesting little tidbits here as you work through this. So kind of the normal stuff. There's a physical description. The system typically came with a QM uh, terminal. We don't have the terminal. I say we're, we're using uh, TerraTerm on a PC to emulate a terminal at this point. Uh, it kind of describes it here. You know, it, it's got a half height, five and a quarter inch, 360k drives, EDA running at four megahertz. There's a reset button, a power LED, uh, and a disk drive activity indicator, the LED on the drive itself. Uh, there's two serial connectors on the back, one for the terminal we're hooked up to here, and there's one for a modem that at, by, by default is 300 baud, but that gets a little more interesting. Uh, kind of gives you some system features here, asynchronous serial terminals, parallel serial printers, up to four disk drives, modems, uh, asynchronous serial peripherals, etc. Uh, it comes with CPM 3.0. There's both a system master and a source master, and then a TMaker master. And uh, I've got a, a, a larger set of disks I found for it than this. So uh, I've been able to use IMD image disk on my 486 PC to write 360K floppies that the uh, PCM101 can actually boot from. And that's how I've got the floppies created for this. It's using IMD with images I found on the web to create bootable media uh, for the machine. So there's several different, well, we'll just keep going forward here through it. Uh, source Master contains the BIOS source code, which is interesting to me that they published the, you know, the BIOS source code, which is really pretty cool. Uh, one of the disks that I actually found out on the web has hard drive. It's configured to uh, control a hard drive. I haven't dug into the details, but it'd be interesting to look at that. Uh, there's, of course, the Centronics parallel port on the back of the machine, and internally there's a pin header that has uh, uh, ports on it as well. So I'm not sure how they were hooking up an external hard drive, but somebody was trying to or was. But it kind of gets into here, you know, CD4 megahertz, there's 128K bytes of, of 64K DRAMs. So 16 of them, they're bank switched. Uh, there's a 2732 uh, boot ROM that seems like all it can do is boot the machine. I've never found a monitor or anything else in it. I haven't actually disassembled it to look. Up to three external optional 360K drives. You know, externally, there's actually a floppy drive connector on the back of the machine. Uh, two 50 to 19 2K uh, asynchronous, you know, serial ports, parallel port, uh, printer ports, Centronics parallel style. Parallel ports, yeah, there's 128. There's 128 parallel ports that are not used in their hardware configuration that can be used uh, externally. We don't have the QM terminal, so I'm not going to kind of jump into those specs. Talks about how to unpack, care and handling of floppies. You've seen all this. We've kind of talked this through. Reset buttons, system power button, this drive here with it, its LED. Uh, there's the two serial connectors, they're full DB25s, uh, terminal and modem. Uh, we don't have the QM terminal again, so it really doesn't matter. Hook up your terminal, power up your computer, insert your SysMaster, boot the machine, and you get to this point here. So let's go ahead and power the machine up at this point. Uh, and it's blinking the status LED on the floppy drive to tell me it's looking for a disk. I'll close the drive. And we can see CPM version 3 loading. The extended BIOS for the Micromate. So there it is. We are booted and into CPM 3. Uh, this is a disk I've been playing with because it's got some basic programs on it. Uh, and some additional stuff. Uh, I think this has even got M, a copy of MBASIC on it. It does. So this is essentially this system master disk uh, with some extra files on it. Uh, basically tells us, you know, hey, you're booted, your final boot message, blah, blah, blah. Uh, talks about how to format disks. So we'll go ahead and format a disk here. Just because they have their own format utility. 
So nice little header here, what you're going to be doing, etc. I'm going to actually, before we do this, I'm in a single drive configuration at the moment. And let's go ahead and talk about the config utility that they provide. We'll go ahead and run it here. It says, hey, I'm a config utility. You're going to give me some information. Here's what I know about your system. Uh, I can see I've already modified stuff in here. So by default, the drive quantity is four. I've changed that to one so it knows there's no extra disk drives besides the A drive. Uh, booting from this disk, the modem is normally at 300 baud. I've apparently changed that to 9600 at some point. But basically you use this to control which you are as the terminal, which one's the modem. Well, I take that back. The baud rates on the terminal and modem, the number of disk drives in the system, and you can write, of course, those change parameters out to uh, the CPM boot disk. Uh, when my external floppy drives get back and I get the cabinet and everything back together, I'll have to change this to three to support those two additional external floppies. Uh, but there's a configuration utility that basically takes care of this. So it's interesting to me, with this set to drive one, there is no concept of B, C, or D drive. It won't prompt you to, you know, put disk D. Apologies, that was an amber alert. Uh, it won't prompt you to put, you know, disk B and drive A kind of thing. There's just a single drive. And it took a while to figure out a copy floppies between a single drive. And, and we'll look at that here as well. So let's exit back to CPM. And go ahead and run format again. And we'll format up a disk. So nice little header. Uh, you know, you're going to format a disk. What do you want to do? I want to format. I want to format drive A. Put a disk in drive A. Let me pull out the master boot disk. And we'll put a dr disk in drive A. Close it. Uh, and it'll go through and format this disk. So remember that in CPM, the definition of this disk is 80 track, double sided, double density. Uh, it's an interesting format. It is five sectors of 2K per sector or 4K per sector? 2K per sector, I believe. Uh, so it's an interesting layout. And maybe that's normal for CPM3, I don't know. Uh, it's not an 80 track drive, it is a 40 track drive, 360K. But, you know, at it's, it's CPM, it treats the sides separately. Uh, you know, track 0 to 39 on the front, or the back, actually the back, and then I think 40 to 79 on the front, if I remember right. Uh, it's been a while, but we're getting a disc all nice and formatted up here. I put a camera on the machine, but there's just not much to see. There's a floppy light on. You know, there's just nothing else going on here. Uh, let me put CPM disk back in, and we will exit back to CPM. We need to tell it to exit. So there really is the format utility they provide for formatting disk. It's I can actually do a format A colon and bypass some of that. But uh, they've really tried to make things, I guess, easier for the non-technical user, in their opinion, by providing these menus. Backup is the same way. We can do a backup. And I guess we can run one here. There's no reason not to. Uh, and it says, hey, I'm your backup utility. You know, what are we going to do here, etc. I'm going to verify data as it's written. So I'm going to say yes to that. I'm going to back up from drive A to A. It knows that because it knows it's a single drive system. If I had additional drives on the system and I had configured it to know about those drives, it would ask, what's your source drive? What's your destination drive? In this case, we were going to copy A to A and swap floppies. So I've got the CPM disk uh, in the machine as the source disk. And right now, the uh, drive LED is actually flashing at me to say, hey, do something in this drive. It'll read the first 10 tracks off the source drive. Uh, if it had errors, let me scroll up here. If it had read errors, uh, there'd be lowercase r's written after these. There weren't, so there was no read errors. It wants the disk we just, well, a destination disk put in. I'm going to use the one we just formatted. 
Again, the uh, floppy light is blinking to say, hey, do something on the drive. And it's the same thing. It's, it's writing out and verifying each track one at a time. And it'd give me a W, a lowercase r, or a lowercase v, if there were write errors, read errors, or verify errors. So, you know, there's no errors so far. Come back to the system floppy. We are a quarter of the way through. Read the next 10 tracks. So it, uh, the manual, of course, has you go through this process with all of the master floppies to get backup copies so that you're not using, you know, your provided masters. I, of course, don't have those provided masters. I can write my own using IMD. Uh, so not as worried about it. And we're 50% through. I just can't imagine sitting and doing this for six floppies. You know, back in the day, I guess we all did it and just didn't think about it. Too used to the modern world. And of course, this would be much more convenient with at least one more floppy drive on the machine. So, and that, of course, will be our final state for this machine. It'll be at least three drives on it, if not maybe even four. These are actually known good floppies. They've been formatted and used pretty extensively here on the machine. I'm going to treat that source disk as if it's an actual master and put it away now. And we'll finish writing our copy disk. Like I said, these utilities, I've never seen, I've never experienced utilities like this in CPM. Uh, you know, other manufacturers may have, may have provided similar stuff. Uh, do you wish to repeat the backup process? No, I do not. And I have a system disk in there that's an exact copy. And, it, you know, it does a warm start of CPM. At least I believe that's a warm start. Maybe it was a cold start. I don't know. So we're on the copy disk now. So if I wanted to copy a file between disks with only one drive, I use a utility called copy file. And it'll ask, uh, here's some information. The file can be a maximum of eight megabytes, which is actually fairly small. I'm gonna copy mBasic between two disks. So, source disk, it reads mBasic in to memory. It wants a destination disk. I will put a different disk in just so that the disk has been swapped. Uh, I've got a pile of disks here. Let me grab one. Uh, you know, there's no way using PIP apparently to copy, for, you know, from and to the same drive. Right error. Well, it failed. That disk may not be formatted or whatever that I just put in. I'm not going to worry about it. Let's put our bootable disk back in. Let's go ahead and reset the machine and do a complete reboot. Why not? <clears throat> so we look at the backup utility here. I've talked a bit about copy file. Uh, configuration we looked at. Uh, this will hit the pages I'm thinking about here eventually. Day-to-day -day power on, power off procedures. Pretty typical stuff. You know, I guess this was also new to people. Of course it was new to people back in the day but where it gets interesting here is if you're not using a 9600 baud terminal and you don't know how to configure your terminal you can boot from the various supplied floppies so if you booted from the cpm30 source floppy it would use a 300 baud external terminal if you booted from system master 9600 from the tk maker master disk you could boot and it would set up a 110 baud terminal so Eventually, I think there was six disks distributed with the system that had different baud rates if you booted off that disk. And so that was a way of 
keeping you from needing to change the baud rate on whatever terminal gear you were using and then you could use the config utility to configure the other floppies to the baud rate you had. I just find that kind of fascinating that they supplied multiple not fascinating they supplied multiple discs but every one of the discs was bootable and had a different baud rate on it. That's just that's an interesting way to deal with different terminals when you don't want to put somebody through the process of figuring out how to change the baud rate on a terminal. So I, you know, I found that interesting. Uh, we recommend double side double density disk drives. Any Atom drives must be able to you know, step at six milliseconds or faster. Uh, somebody thought that was an important note to write in. Uh, it's pretty standard stuff. It's a standard 34 pin floppy connector out the back of the machine to standard 34 pin floppies. It's the normal drive select 1, 2, 3, 4, or as it's marked on the drives, of course, 0, 1, 2, 3. Uh, 0 is by default the drive in the little case with the computer. Information on the ports, the format utility we've looked at, describes the menus, what it does here. Advanced operation, format common drive, you can do it a little bit quicker without all the stuff, uh, all the menu stuff. We ran backup, there's information on backup. Uh, it kind of shows what it did here, you, you know, in our case, it, it's, we watched this run in real time, so there's no reason to dive deeper into this. The config utility we've looked at a little bit, you know, we saw this screen, this is the default, I believe, settings from the factory. I know the 9600 and 300 baud are. Uh, okay, drive quantity one probably is the default from the factory. The, the images I built my discs from were set to four. So, and when it's set to four and there isn't, you know, drive B, C, and D aren't connected and you do a B colon to go to drive B, the machine's hung. Uh, it never times out, it never comes back, it's a reboot, uh, which isn't that surprising. Uh, terminal and modem setup, uh, various baud rates. So the baud rates are actually controlled on the hardware um, at the hardware level. So you, you're actually writing a nibble for each one of the reorts individually to tell it what baud rate to generate. So it's you know it's hardware controlled baud rate generation. It's not you know a strap on the board or something. It's, it's actually you know a port write that does it, which of course makes sense because you can boot the machine at different baud rates. Uh, all the configuration, the number of drives, you write the configuration back out. There's a convert utility, but unfortunately it doesn't support DOS, which was too bad. Convert, we can run it to convert between various CPM formats. Uh, enter the drive letter, the drive to be used. We're just going to put in a dummy drive letter. And it'll ask us which drive format we want to use. And so this would allow you to take one of your additional drives and remap it to be, you know, in the format of one of these systems. Uh, you know, there's an IBM PC entry, but it's for CPM. Uh, would have been nice had there been a straight 360K DOS entry here, because that would have been very useful for transferring files to and from the system. Uh, but there isn't, at least the version of the utility I have. Uh, there's this we can use convert, you know, uh, convert, you know, drive to a type. This could be in the uh, profile at startup if you wanted a drive to always be of a certain type. Uh, there's the SysTest utility, and this is interesting because SysTest, I haven't actually tried this yet. I need to go through this. SysTest, we can run it here. At least we can start it. It'll get this far and appear to hang. It'll stop here at some point. And there it goes. It's waiting for a blank disk, I believe, to be mounted at this point. But notice there's no I.O. And that's because it's using the modem port by default for communications. So I'm going to go ahead and reboot. Uh, and it basically takes you through a process here where you make a copy of your master disk. You delete the help file executable and, and you know file off the disk to create room. Uh, and then you can basically, you know, run tests, and but you've got to have a terminal hooked up to the modem port, that 300 baud port. Uh, and I just haven't configured the floppy yet to do this and test this out. Uh, when I get this done, we'll 
demo it in a different video, but it will test, like it says, all, all, all memory, all major ICs, etc. So you know, it's interesting it came with that. There's a bunch of deviations from the normal CPM Plus. Uh, it actually is listing here that same thing, the default power on parameters for the three different boot disks uh, with the different baud rate for the main terminal. Uh, file name differences, it's interesting. They basically took all of the ASM files for CPM3 and built them into BIOS3, so it's a little bit different. Uh, I think than the normal, I haven't built CPM3 in ages, so I, I probably shouldn't talk with any authority to this. There is, of course, a, a, a CTC chip on the board, so it implements a real-time clock. But, as is always in, is the case with these, if you're doing a lot of floppy I.O., uh, the clock doesn't count, and so the time will drift further and further off. Uh, pretty different, or, pr or pretty normal. Uh, X on, X off. Uh, how the bank switching is basically done. There's a little bit of technical information in here. Uh, their memory map. So, you know, it it's, is what it is. It's a 64K CPM machine with banked memory. There's a million different ways to do it. Uh, physical specifications. Uh, the drive type. Uh, is it actually, well, that's the, the CPM definition. There it is, five sectors per track, 1,024 bytes per sector. Apologies, I'm being texted here at the moment. I'm going to ignore it. So it's two-sided, 40 tracks per cylinder, or 40 cylinders per disc, but that's double-sided, so it becomes the, you know, the full 80 tracks per side. Uh, but it's interesting to me that it's five sectors per track of 1,024 bytes. That just seems odd to me, but maybe that's normal. I don't know. There's, you know, there's no uh, sector translation table. It's just a one-to-one. -one. 128 directory entries. I mean, pretty standard stuff. It's just a 5, 10, 24 is a little odd to me. Uh, I'm struggling with... So one of the things I'm struggling with with uh, uh, image disk, I, IMD, is getting proper gaps between things. And maybe I can pick the values out of here. I can write a bootable floppy from IMD and the system will boot, but if I try to write back to that floppy, it, it's instantly trashed. And no longer boots, the disk is just unusable. And I'm assuming when it's going out to the directory and trying to write to it, the directory is getting trashed. And I think that's because it's probably got to do with the gap between the sectors. Because I'm using whatever the default IMD is. And, and if you read the documentation, it talks about this. So to produce actually usable, bootable floppies, I use IMD to create the floppy. I format a floppy in the actual drive on the, on the 101 machine. I then use backup to back up the disk I wrote on the PC to the one I formatted in the machine. And then I got a good disk I can read and write from on the machine. That's a little bit painful, but not that untypical. The baud rate nibbles that I, I mentioned. It, it's really cool kind of having these examples in here of the CPM. You know, disk parameter header, the disk parameter block, all that. It's kind of cool. They, they captured all that. They, of course, they provide the source. Uh, layout, blah, blah, blah. Boot sequence. It's, there's 32K. It's a 2732, so there's 4K by 8. There's 4K of available ROM there. It's just boot and nothing else. That's what confuses me. There's enough room there for a simple monitor. Uh, and of course, it's a phantom ROM. I mean, that's typical. Uh, you know, the ROM's in the address space when the machine's powered up, and then when you're, it's part of the boot process. You replace that 4K block with RAM because CPM wants continuous memory starting at address zero on up. And because the Z80 resets to address zero, you need the ROM temporarily in that place to get you know to boot from you know boot starting by ROM. So it's just weird to me that there's no like. Many monitor build in or 4K is a lot of space to do simple stuff. Uh, cable pinouts are covered here. So, you know, that, that's kind of comprehensive. We've looked at the board in previous videos, but, you know, the board again here. 
Uh, there's the you know, parallel port interface here that I'm assuming is that expansion. The 128 bytes is they or, or 128 ex, you know extra ports as they call it. I think are probably all addressable off here. Potentially, I don't know that for sure. Uh, various error messages and what they might mean. Oh, it's a wonderful troubleshooting section that, yeah, it doesn't tell you much. Stuff to look at externally, and that really is the user manual. Uh, we've got the technical manual as well. I was really happy to find this. And it doesn't have a whole lot more information in it. I mean, block diagram of the machine. Uh, there's a little bit more information here for figuring out bank switching and that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, they tell you like ports 80 to 83 are for the floppy disk controller, but they don't tell you which port is what. You know, you know, these ports are used, but you don't know which are what for most of these, and I find that kind of interesting. Uh, at least I haven't found any good examples in here of this bit is this, that you know, this byte is that. Different way of representing the memory map. Uh, schematics are actually very readable and very usable. I know they're not showing it well here on the screen, but they really are very usable. Uh, very happy with the schematics and the copy here, and that's it for the technical reference. So let's make this thing do something. So kind of wrap this up. So we're we'll running basic. We'll load sine wave dot base basic and everybody's seen this you know there it is saying hello world there's a sine wave pretty typical little demo for a machine like this I've got some uh, basic programs on additional floppies let me mount one of those so I've actually got a lot of I got a lot of the creative computing stuff on floppy uh, if I do files I can see what's on the disk I just mounted and there's a few, you know, there's a few programs on there. Uh, load, load, load basic. I kind of like this. This is kind of a neat little program. Your message. I'm just going to say hello. And if you're old enough, you will recognize the poster this came from, the sign this came from. Uh, and that's kind of cool that it can take your little message and map it onto screen. I forgot, this thing's actually got a game menu on it that lets you pick various games uh, off the disc. And of course the games menu is written in basic. Uh, Life 2, have I even looked at that? And it's case specific here. If I do Life 2 lowercase, it will not find it. Oh, there's actually a syntax error in 1000. If error equals 53, then print that file does not exist. Please re-enter close four that four hanging out there is weird so yeah i these have just been written to disk they haven't been checked for syntax or anything else most of them have been run player one three live pieces ub life game i have no idea oh well most of these I haven't ran. Uh, is there anything here worth running? I mean, it's it's a standard thing. It's CPM machine. It's 128K, which is nice. Bank memory. Uh, you know, 4 megahertz Z80, double-sided, double-density floppy drive. Uh, you know, drives 360k drives. I mean, it's a nice little machine for the era. I think it's from about 1982, is my guess. Though I don't know that. I'm gonna put the system disk back in, and I'll keep yammering here while we look at things. So, on that disk is the traditional Star Trek uh, and the Star Trek instructions. Uh, you've seen it a million times. I'm not gonna run it. Uh, let's go ahead and load 555ic.bat bat dot basic jeez I thought this was kind of cool desired frequency the oscillator so let's do 1 megahertz 
and it gives us the pinout and it starts looking at standard values it is thinking here uh, okay I think it's processing it is continue maybe I shouldn't have used a megahertz because I think I've used uh, lower frequencies before and had it respond a little bit quicker let's just do 1k hertz so uh, while I was looking for other stuff here it actually came up with three more sets of resistor uh, capacitor values so they're 0.047 that's pretty standard 0.047 interesting 620 and 15k or 560 and 16k and that small difference in the capacitance anyhow there's a couple other interesting things to look at here uh, there's an ad here let's go ahead and look at because I found this ad really interesting your model 100 deserves more than a, you know, a disk drive and so it's got a tandy model 100 here classic little machine you know with the LCD screen uh, hopefully everybody knows what a model 100 looks like and it's being advertised as an add-on for the model 100 but if you read through the ad uh, it, so to turn your model 100 into a powerhouse you can use your model 100 as a terminal for the micromate and use any RC terminal for big screen convenience so you could basically carry you know as a, as a terminal and nothing else to talk to your micromate it's like okay that's why is that targeted that way you know, $1,000 for the base machine. Yeah, it gives you a more capable machine potentially in the end than the Model 100. But I just found that ad fascinating. That if you have a Model 100, you can buy our machine and use your Model 100 as a terminal. Interesting bit of advertising. And I don't really know. I may have scrolled it too big there. I don't really know why <laughs> that was thought of as an ad. Uh, I think there's a second. Is there a second ad? Maybe not. That may have been it uh, that I was able to locate. I guess that was it. So this is just going to keep cranking away here, finding values for us. Uh, anything else worth looking at at this point? Really not. So I guess we'll wrap this one up here. Uh, hopefully there was some interest in this. I guess we'll talk soon.